the first time i heard the word mahakal was actually the virat kohli video where he goes jay mahakal jay mahakal jay mahakal it taught me as a guy in mumbai who's never heard of mahakal it taught me about mahakal what in that temple is calling these people mahakal is that being which is at the last frontier of your imagination Wow. And Mahakal is the highest form of Bhairava. There is no difference between Shiva and Bhairava. It is only the Maya of Shiva that makes you see these two as different. I think that's the beauty of Sanatan Dharma in the first place that you have options. Absolutely. In this path, sanctified alcohol is offered to the mother. By the way, is that also consumed by the? Father? Yeah, it becomes prasad. The most powerful shakti that has been created are three. First is sex, then money, then power. Everything is governed by these three. A man who goes beyond these three is the same. So there are humans around us today on this earth which are reincarnations of a being that was previously in a lower realm. Very often, Sri Aurobindo had written in some of his writings. Somebody like Stalin, he was an asura. So the greater the evil, the greater is the amount of damage it will cause. And in fact, about Hitler also, exorcism tried on Hitler by church during that time. After every single spiritualism-based episode on TRS, one of the top comments is always bring Rajeshi Nandi back on TRS. This is the first part of a four-part series that we've built with Rajeshi Nandi during his recent Mumbai visit. We've centered the conversation around Bhairav and Shaivism-based tantra. We go into many tangential directions. You're going to enjoy this episode. It's just like the other Rajeshi Nandi episodes. what i will tell you is that he was in mumbai in order to collaborate on a project with myself and with my level supermind team level supermind is an app that i've built over the last 3 years it's a mind performance app with a lot of guided meditations built into it we've got lots of spiritual leaders who've created content on the app but it's the honor of my life that rajeshi nandi's work is now also present on my app So if you want even more of him after this episode make sure you check out Level Supermind he's recorded multiple guided meditations related to multiple different deities that will kind of help you begin or go deeper into your own journey towards the deities but for now all I'll say is that Rajesh Nandi has finally returned on TRS <music> I'm genuinely so happy to see you sitting in front of me sir same here and everyone else is also very very happy seeing you on TRS it's wonderful to be back and jai bhairav baba jai ma kamakhya jai ma tara um jai bhairav baba jai ma kamakhya jai ma tara this is the first episode i'm doing without a tara statue sitting here yeah uh, because they say that the purpose of statues and devices and yantras at some point is to make its way into your heart and being so as long as the yantra device or even the mantra lies within your body uh you've achieved the purpose that it was built for is that a fair assessment or you think murtis uh and other yantras actually have power that should be uh kept in the middle of podcast always no so that depends so it's uh murtis have their power there is no denying it but at the same time what you said is also correct eventually as sadhana progresses the greatest upasak is eventually that individual breaking down all technical language aside whose body becomes the yantra whose mind becomes the mantra whatever he speaks whatever he acts it is the deity acting matara has to be eventually she should sit here in the mind and it is her force that should work to the vak speech okay and that speech then acquires a capacity that is self actualizing means jisko what is known technically as vak siddhi eventually okay she has three forms one of the forms is neela saraswati she creates knowledge a very spontaneous kind of outpouring of knowledge that happens that is beyond gyana gyan is like very high level of knowledge you have that comes to saraswati she is something that gives you something even beyond that okay it's it's something bursts out from within your being and that is perhaps for lack of better words what is enlightenment 
It is an illumination that comes out through the Shakti of words and through anything that you focus on. It's a different realm. Um, what was the word you used? Some vak, vak siddhi. Vak siddhi. Vak is speech. Siddhi means uh, accomplishment in speech, which is basically another way of saying that such individual, whatever comes out of their mouth, knowingly or unknowingly, has some way, nature will use all her resources to ensure that that comes true. Okay. Like as in what you say, the words you use can become a manifested reality. Yes. Will become a manifested reality. People like that exist in... Everything exists. We may or may not be aware. We may not, may not be able to meet the such people. But everything is possible. Whatever is possible also exists. Is reality an outcome of the wills of higher beings entirely? Or do we as simpler beings also contribute to reality? I think everybody contributes at his level. Okay. So there is... This question comes in. If we rephrase this question, it is basically a question about whether there's destiny, whether there's free will. If things yeah, are... Effectively. Effectively. So uh, I had heard a parable long back. I don't remember who it was, some saint perhaps. So there's this uh, boy, young boy, who's standing and he asks the same question to the saint. And the saint uh, tells him, Acha, why don't you stand on one leg? So he decides to stand on his left leg. Okay, so left leg is standing, right leg he lifts up. Now he asks him, can you now stand on your left leg also? He said, no, then I'll fall. So he's saying what you did at that time created the karma. Now the reaction is here. Now it creates a constraint. If you lift the other leg also, you'll fall. That much is certain. So there is this constant feedback loop going on based on what you're doing right now, based on things you might have done, based on things that creates a momentum in your mind, body. This is what we call samskara. Things that you have carried from your past birth. Remnants of various tendencies. Upasanas that you have done. Deities that you have worshipped. People you have interacted with. Good, bad, everything. It comes along with that. and But it is not fixed, by the way. So that is the game. So you cannot believe that, oh, well, everything is fixed. Why should I make an effort? No. You have to make an effort because by your effort, it is constantly getting modified. And this whole process is engineered by nature which is so powerful, so fantastic, no human mind can actually comprehend the complexity of this. Is your effort also manufactured then? Perhaps. So it, it goes back very, it goes to a very uh, deep state. See, this is where in uh, just um, plugging in something from Jyotishas, we say something known as the Drira Karmas, fixed karma. So some aspects of your life may be fixed. For example, if you're born, you'll die. Uh, more or less, we believe that the moment of death time of death and the circumstances of your death, when you are going to die, who all will be present, etc. These things are fixed at right at the time when you are born. Okay, So these are kind of things that cannot be changed easily. Whereas in between uh, what you do, where do you work, you change your company, you change your house, you have friends, you have this, that, etc. So those are more fluid circumstances that change. There is a certain degree of momentum of karma that is coming and certain activity that you are performing. These two are interacting and producing a result. Okay. Uh, I'm still trying to dive deeper into the same thought of, is everything truly pre-planned, including your own personality and including the actions you take? Because free will as a concept is not something I fully wrapped my head around. Okay. And to explain that, I'll try using my own life because it's probably the largest justice I can serve to this thought. Right. Because that's what you know best. Mm. When I play football, there's only one way I know how to play, hmm. which is I run all around the pitch. Hmm. So I'm the guy who will be everywhere, hmm. etc. Hmm. Football is a showcase of character. Hmm. My friends know that I'm one of the most hardworking football players. Hmm. And that's usually how my work happens also. I'm not the smartest or most talented, but I'll run around hmm. a lot. Hmm. And there was a long phase in my life where I was arrogant about my ability to work hard. Hmm. When eventually I realized that even your abilities are probably God-given. Hmm. And even the hard work you're doing mm. is fueled because of something else. Mm. Right. Why Why was I not able to work hard in mm. engineering college? Mm. I mean, there are reasons for that. <laughs> but I'm talking about from a natural perspective. Mm. The moment I got out of engineering college, mm. there was just an urge to work hard. Mm. And unless I'm able to work hard, I don't feel a sense of peace. Now, is that truly my doing? Is that free will at play? Or am I pre-programmed to so, be able to work hard? Free will and... 
pre-programmed or fate for lack of better words are intertwined so strongly that it is very difficult to separate these things out you'll have to break down that sentence again free will and fate are intertwined so strongly that it is very difficult for an average individual to find out ki which part of it is fated and which part of it is my own effort so as a so the point is there are two aspects one is if you are a philosopher and one is if you are the ordinary person living life so ordinary person living life your question is what has nature given me nature has given you an intelligence has given you a human body and certain degree of uh, judgment your circumstances etc within that things that are inside within your capacity which is say hard work so understanding okay i need to get this job i need to prepare for it to go for an interview etc these are things you can do so this intelligence nature has given you which means that nature wants you to act based on that so nature does not want most of the people to sit and think is this free will or is this destiny will i get the job no nature wants you to act according to that law there will be 5 to 10% people who may have again for lack of better words through their sadhana or whatever else their mind may have expanded to another zone for them nature puts in this questions that no now you see is there is this the only reality is there other graded forms of reality is is things predestined at some other level wow. and it comes down here in a way and this concept it may sound difficult but it is fundamental in understanding whether a dream will come true or not by the way whether a dream will come true as in whether any of your dreams no i don't mean dream in a figurative way i mean dream in a very literal way when you have a dream okay when you have a dream i was just explaining to somebody 2 3 days ago so when you have a dream so people have vivid dreams and all that so one of the most many people have dreams good 60% of the dreams come from your own subconscious mind which are completely junk it's completely useless you might have seen something heard something that only your mind comes and tells you then there is a percentage of the dream that is basically uh, a reality that is happening around you but your conscious mind refuses to acknowledge it so then your body and subconscious tries to tell you that ye ho raha hai this is what is happening and that is the only time it can do is when you are sleeping then there is another dream which comes from a higher level of reality but this level is not very far from your physical existence so your reality is both your physical existence and your conscious existence so where is your consciousness linked to if your consciousness is linked to the material plane it is fine if your consciousness is linked to the plane of the deities then you live here but you are not exactly here part of you are somewhere else also can you link your consciousness to the realm of the deities by simply thinking about it very tough possible but you must be a pers- some an individual with tremendous concentration power which is what bhakti technically is not always okay so uh, uh, so when you ask me this question there are multiple answers i can see from there so i can't fully agree i can't fully disagree okay fair so let me complete that chain of thought yes. so this there is a realm which is not very far from our physical plane uh, let's just for lack of better words let's call it a lower astral plane or astral plane sort of okay sometimes dreams will come from there and you will see it is very accurate like specific details are mentioned x y z ye hone wala hai that is going to happen this is going to happen etc etc so those dreams will either happen at a very quick pace say within 10 days 15 days or a month maximum or it can also be changed by the right corrective measures suppose the dream says that you might have an accident so you take precautions whatever else jo bhi hai and uh, you might avoid the accident you might have just a little bit of scratch on your hand instead of something big yeah you can avoid fully also there's another dream and this is the rarest this comes from beyond the astral planes which is again for lack of better words let's call it the spiritual planes the planes where the gods reside and the higher realities are where ignorance is very less okay those realms if it comes from a dream the dream takes time to manifest it is not going to happen in one day it will take years but nothing in the universe can change it it is something that has been already executed in that realm and it is just waiting to manifest here and nothing can be done about it it is going to happen it, it will not happen immediately because time doesn't go in the same pace in all realities so if that happens maybe a year two years down the line it is definitely going to execute if it is going to happen in a very very visible and proper way and generally those dreams do not come very often to people that realm 
but uh, it can happen to people who are into sadhana or who have a spiritual bent of mind sometimes and those can dictate to you things that will happen years later 5 6 10 years later also and they are unchangeable by the way those dreams are unchangeable so the point is whenever a dream happens in an individual unless he has the capacity to first investigate and understand which realm this dream is coming from so you will not know not every dream is supposed to be taken seriously if it comes from this realm then it is definitely going to happen and then also there is nothing much you can do about it so it's set uh <laughs> All my life, some very important literal dreams hmm. have involved animals, hmm. and this began happening to me in my teenage. So hmm. I would Google it a lot. Hmm. Dream about orcas. Dream hmm. about lion. Hmm. Dream about hmm. pigeon. Hmm. Whatever. Hmm. Uh, eventually, I realized that there's a bunch of websites, hmm. including one website called ArabicDreams.com. Okay. And I realized this is a phenomenon across culture where people have had dreams about animals. Hmm. for years hmm. is that a uh, spiritually significant because each animal is supposed to represent something and perhaps it is confirmation bias on my part where i see something and then uh, i think that okay maybe this is what's happening but very often it's come true like hmm. maybe it's confirmation bias in my experience i believe i actually wait for these animal dreams and nowadays they don't happen as much hmm. used to happen a lot more when i was younger uh Am I being shown animals because I relate with animals as ideas, or generally do people see a lot of animals in their dreams, and do they have any kind of spiritual significance? So not everybody sees animals in the dreams, but again, just exactly what I told right now. So whenever you have a dream, whether it's an animal dream or other dream, first thing you have to understand is that a is it coming because of your subconscious, which means that are you interacting with a lot of animals? Say maybe. you're reading books on animals if you're if it's a small child and who's reading uh, some some book that has got a lot of animal characters and all that so that can play in the mind okay or you are working with animals somehow animal rescue thing or something like that so you have to be very objective the mind and not just the mind the human ego is like this we always want to believe ki kuch to mere liye aa raha hai special theek mm. hai because i am special so the universe is treating me special but the thing is that universe doesn't care <laughs> the quicker you realize this that there's absolutely nobody who is special here because like you there are millions who have come millions will who are here millions will go and the universe has been constantly watching happily theek hai it's watching the show so once you realize that there's an objectivity a dispassion comes in that is when you can investigate first thing to be investigated is is the dream coming from a lower realm or a higher realm if it's a higher realm my uh, best guess because i don't know without the exact dream no two dreams are diff- same uh, even with animal dreams also suppose if the theme is animal two dreams will not be the same because they may not come from the same realm uh, it's very likely that animals are metaphorical for certain things that are happening in your life and that is a way of your subconscious mind trying to tell you which you were consciously not acknowledging hmm. more details than that i can't say without actually you know uh, investigating of the dream or things like that a dreams an important part of tantra no no it's an important part of human beings it is an important part of human beings of course so why do you dream you can't dismiss whatever it. nature has given you naturally without effort without effort you dream right you don't have to put in a special effort i mean there are ways of putting special efforts and all that in natural course whatever happens in a natural way naturally occurs in a human being those are tools that nature has given you and you can use them to the best possibility that you can imagine okay great moment in the conversation to bring up sex <laughs> <laughs> what is the purpose because the school of yoga ha huh. which i have followed as well until i met you <laughs> <laughs> and you've switched me over a little bit no it is bhairav baba is he is the one who does all things until i met you and bhairav baba yes uh yoga often talks about restricting yourself and i believe that there is power in that if you follow that path mm. you know it has a certain set mm. uh bunch of rules right and if you follow those rules yes. eventually you will go fast yes. down that path yes which is why even schools like yss where i've learned all my meditation and you know basics of energization yes. exercises mm. that has power mm. it did create mm. very very mm. big differences in my life but i know for a fact that the school of thought related to yoga says that restrict your mouth and restrict your end mm. and the person who's able to restrict their mouth which means mm. don't eat everything that you mm. want mm. and who's able to restrict their mm. reproductive system mm. 
actually gains power over mm. themselves mm. uh i do believe this mm. power in just this thought mm. but that's not really what tantra says mm. I, i don't know mm. if i've said something wrong about the world of tantra nothing wrong i'll rephrase this sure so what you are saying is correct if you have control over what you uh, in fact more than eating eating is one aspect what you speak that is another thing we completely uh, mistake half the problems of the world are because of speaking not speaking speaking more speaking less in the right manner communication is the problem in the world okay so speech and your reproductive organ if you have a control over it that is um, in in classical yoga that is very important to have a control because you are trying through various methods whether it is um, through physical yogic exercises or control of your prana to awaken that latent power inside same thing and it will push you upwards as a kind of um uh, boost your spiritual evolution in order to do that whenever you are specifically indiscriminate use of the reproductive organs indiscriminate use of sex uh enhances that uh force inside your being which actually kind of debilitates or hampers this process so that is why the idea is you restrict or you go into brahmacharya even okay you do not you completely stay away from sex uh here the catch is is not just the physical thing you have to be mentally also in that state as yeah. in you can't even think of sex yeah that that is more difficult than that because of what is going to happen in this world the most powerful shakti that has been created are three first is sex then money then power everything is governed by these three iske aage bhi destinies are connected to these three a man who goes beyond these three is a saint that is the first step step towards sainthood sex money and power yes all three, everything good and bad everything whatever whenever uh, human beings revolve around these three chakras and these three chakras are just this sex money and power okay power comes from here hmm. power will manifest as your ego or corruption or greed i want more same thing happens in all the three by the way there's an element of greed involved so once you enjoy it once you enjoy power once you enjoy sex once you enjoy uh, uh, money. money the next thing is that i want more of it i want more of it and that will the moment you want more it is going to corrupt your discrimination power and then you will make mistakes and then you will justify ki the end justifies the means which is never true till the time your grahas are good you will have a good run then the day things change you will fall and that is all destinies in the world human life revolves around these three things everything fundamentally but say if you are doing a tantra practice I as is the case with so many of the listeners who are listening in hmm. what is tantra practice practicing upon a mantra hmm. using a yantra hmm. if you are abstaining if you are keeping a satvik diet hmm. intact hmm. uh you're trying to also follow the yogic way will it add power to your practices so coming back to coming back to the fundamentals of tantra sadhana the way the way i read from the text and the way i believe it works so there is tantra believes in a graded form of practice okay the initial stages which is that it believes in what is known as dakshinachara tantra the right hand path let's say for the sake of um, easier understanding so there all these rules come into play so you have restriction of food what you are eating you have restriction of uh, physical intimacy and baki jo whatever rules are there all are there but you have the liberty to use all mantras all yantras all tantras okay everything can be done but only in the satvik manner this is dakshinachara okay and it's very popular in a lot of places in india large part of tantra sadhana that goes under practicing tantra a lot of people actually do dakshinachara tantra okay i would argue that even any hindu in india who's doing a puja at home is actually doing dakshinachara no nah, so you have to understand this so when you're doing a puja in home you might be doing it in the puranic method so tantra comes into play when those mantras and yantras come into play without that there is no tantra gotcha so okay. what's what's the what's a version of a satvik yantra no satvik yantra nahi so basically you will need to, even to practice dakshinachara tantra uh, you need to have an initiation into it okay gotcha so that is the entry criteria okay so without initiation also you may worship but those that worship is there are restrictions that certain mantras cannot be done should not be done may have a counter uh, uh, you know effect on you 
so if i am doing my om bhairava namaha mm. jap which i have learned from your video mm. am i not initiated and am i not doing tantra yet let's say this is the preliminary stages you are doing sadhana that is akin to tantra sadhana Understood. but that is not fully tantra sadhana full tantra sadhana requires an initiation and a proper one so here uh, as a sake of because for the sake of clarity to the listeners when i say initiation i don't mean upadesham so there are two things one is upadesham is an advice so i tell you chant om bhairavaya namaha or i tell anybody that is an upadesham okay uh, now for initiation initiation is a puja that the guru will do who is qualified to do on a disciple and the aim of the puja is basically so that that specific individual from that point onwards will worship devi uh, mostly devi mantras uh, mahavidya mantras and all that without there should be no obstacles in his path this is called the abhishek diksha and that is very important in tantra there should be no obstacles in his path yes means means that you are starting off in the journey of sadhana say suppose uh, you want to do ma kali sadhana so simple or ma tara sadhana you go to a guru the guru says okay you have fitness for it and all that so on a auspicious day he calls you he does a specific puja in your name you will be part of the puja puja havan a lot of things will happen and then he will give you the mantra after that and say from now on he will tell you what are the rules of the mantra how to chant when to chant etc etc and the aim of the puja is basically in his parampara the deities he worships and the others he is asking them that there should be no obstacles in the path of his sadhana let his sadhana go smoothly okay and that is important when one enters into the realm of mahavidya sadhana mahavidya is a very intense forces that becomes important now coming back to the question after dakshinachara there is a stage that is vamachara there are certain tantric schools that don't go into vamachara they only restrict themselves only to dakshinachara but there are kola tantras which specifically mention and there are very fantastic texts from 10th century 11th century lot of them actually text after text shastras are very clear on this that after you master dakshinachara then you enter vamachara vamachara is left vam means left okay so this is where till now you are doing everything but you are doing in a satvik manner so you are using the mantras you have the right to do mahavidya sadhana on this in dakshinachara say you are doing matara or makali upasana you are doing the japa you are doing mantra anushthan baki everything is there except you are using uh, satvik ingredients for the puja the moment you enter into vamachara you have to start using the panchatattva panchatattva is where meat fish all these things will come into play whether you like it or not is irrelevant it has to be offered to the deity with the right mantra the idea is that it's the natural course of development of shakti that is happening in the dakshinachara standard way of you are going now nature is saying that let's go the reverse way and see that whether your mantra works that way also that things which you have denied yourself and said that no this is wrong or this is dark if your mantra and a sadhana is complete it should work there also if it is not complete then it is only a partial condition like when i sit in the home in my asan i feel very good on the road there is too much of traffic i am not feeling well no nature is saying at the end everything is your home you have to attain to perfection both in the light and the dark you have to attain to perfection both in the satvik and what technically people call rajasik or tamasik actually the deities are neither rajasik nor tamasik they are trigunatita the texts tell you the divine mother is not satvik she is beyond the three gunas she can assume sattva guna she can assume tar, assume tama guna when the necessity of the activity demands it when she has to fight an asura she will attain that kind of capacity and how can she switch these gunas because she is beyond the gunas so you cannot become the mother but you can at least aim towards that direction this is the philosophical orientation why vamachara came into existence and is very strong presence in the eastern part of india from kamakhya to bengal to all this is all somewhere or the other linked to vamachara in fact in our in tarapit temple and all the bhog itself is uh, fish and all is given to the mother daily that's very standard there's nobody raises an eyebrow in vamachar when you're offering meat are you also supposed to eat the meat yeah after that is prasad so here the rule is that if you are entering into that deity's domain uh generally it is a good idea if the prasad comes to you not to be fussy about it why if you are fussy about the prasad then my first question is why are you even in this path so it is like i i go to a friend's house 
friend gives me some food no i don't want to eat the food that's insulting to the friend and this is not even a friend it's a deity so then you switch paths to something there you are comfortable with it the path of yoga teaches us that if you eating uh, meat then you're also ingesting karmas now right everything ingests karmas i would say even your plant based diet will also ingest karmas but i use the term prasad prasad means something that has been sanctified by the power of the devata then it is no more it's it's not about meat it's not about uh, vegetarian dishes it's nothing prasad is a different category of thing so uh, sri ramakrishna thakur sri ramakrishna who was perhaps the greatest kali upasaka that ever lived in the last 2 300 years unse upar koi tha hi nahi he was he was except alag hi level so uh, towards the end of his life he used to eat very less food he he had uh he had cancer uh, towards the end of his life because he took in the karmas of lot of disciples and people all sorts of karmas and that's his kindness that's the kindness of a saint and uh he used to almost uh, stop eating non vegetarian food towards the end of his life but whenever the bali prasad used to happen bali used to happen ma kali temple bali will happen prasad used to be there he used to even as a respect used to not only do a namaskara to it and then take a little bit and just put it in his mouth as a taste in his younger days he had had all this all at a at a later stage when it came from within him somehow and plus his health was also failing he decided that he will stick to a uh, very less not even vegetarian actually the food that he used to eat towards the end was when I mean, a normal vegetarians also won't be able to eat so because his health was also little yeah. but never did he ever disrespect the prasad that was given never did he ever say that you should stop the bali and all that what is sanctioned in the shastras is sanctioned in the shastras it is not based on your i like it i dislike it no the reason why all this are given by the rishis you find out what your tendency is accordingly you do that if you are if you are not comfortable why are you even stepping into that zone yeah i think that's the beauty of sanatan dharma in the first yes. place that you have options absolutely and absolutely. whatever we're talking about here is one path exactly there are multiple paths yes But and in this path only not only meat not only sanctified alcohol is offered to the mother by the way is that also consumed by the upasaka yeah it becomes prasad in fact i remember once i was doing a a mantra of uh, devi mantra which had just uh, so just appeared in my mind some issues were going on so i thought i'll just do one mala of it for 9 10 days and i had a very fantastic result and that inspired me to carry on the mantra so there was a mantra i was chanting for few days and then uh, at the end of it uh, after around 40 days of chanting i visited a very old kali temple it's it must be at least 6 5 600 years old um it was in western part of india which is not even eastern part okay rajasthan uh, kali temple and it was a casual visit i was visiting the city and i just went there and i remember um the pandit ji was there and uh, i just put my hand like this charanamrita is given to whoever comes prasad or charanam so he looks at me and he pours something in my hand and i just consume it and there's a immediate like a like a tongue that this is not water and then i'm looking at him and then he's smiling at me so this was a prasad this was this was sanctified karan we call it which was offered to the mother and then he gave me a bit of the prasad it was alcohol yeah but we don't use the word alcohol we use the word karan because it is it cannot be randomly just picked up so it there are mantras and processes through which it is purified and then only it has to be offered to the deity mother and after that it becomes prasad but you are just supposed to have a bit of it i'm assuming no that depends so there are there are processes depending on the sadhana that you are doing depending on the sadhana that you are doing the thumb rule is that you can never allow it to control you basically you so this is not a license to get drunk in fact the kola tantras mentioned this very clearly it's a very beautiful verse which says that if only drinking alcohol was enough then every uh, you know your bar would have been filled with siddhas <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time the text says that there is nothing beyond the kola it is the final state and it is by shiva's agya that the kola is there and it exists and it says that once you enter the kola path it is it's different it's different from your wife from your friend from your relatives from everybody you are fit for it you will reach the highest possible realms and if you're not fit for it you'll fall 
it is the kola path is to be entered after lifetimes of practice in tantra also it's not even the first stage and there certain processes are there where you might have to consume more also but the key is you need to have that self control to know how much you can consume and how much you should not consume because after consumption you will have to sit and do mantra japa you have to sit and do puja there can be no flaw in it damn yeah i if i may add an anecdote to it there was long Please. back i had we wait for this <laughs> but go on <laughs> there was a uh, long back before i even uh, first came to kamakya i had met one uh, uh, great uh, tantra pasak whose advice helped me a lot i was still struggling to find clarity in certain aspects uh, that man was terrific uh, he was a uh, uh, upasaka of ma kali and not just normal kali smashan kali cremation ground form of kali so he had first told me <clears throat> that you have to start going to kamakya because your root will be from there uh, so he once described to me an incident he used to sit once in a while he used to sit in sadhana so it's like this he will have a sanctified bottle of karan and he makes offerings to the mother with it uh, and then he consumes that and then he does mantra japa and then again another one then again another after some time and the funny part is that when he used to do that uh, normally what i've seen in the average course when people consume alcohol they start behaving in all sorts of manners which they end up regretting next day this gentleman the more he used to take the more serious he'll become he is not laughing around he is not joking nothing it's like deeper and deeper into meditation is going deeper and deeper and after some time the aura of that place would change such that you will feel scared to even utter a word he will not speak with you after that because his mind is going to the deity there is a shakti inside that thing what we call alcohol it is through mantras is using that shakti as a boost to take his mind to the realm of where the deity is but because it is very powerful it has its negative aspects also which is why in the traditional formal religion it is kind of something that is um, if we go by the laws of uh, manu uh, manusmriti and all that or the other dharma shastras they allow you to eat meat but so far as this is concerned it's strict banned you just can't have this but tantra says no we change this through the mantras we purify it we offer it to the deity and even today whether it's tarapit whether it's kamakya she is offered this and after that you take it as a prasad uh we had another upasak on the hindi podcast his name was parakom and he gave us two incredible episodes okay uh and i'm going to relay couple of the things he mentioned of mm. course i'm going to relay a bit of it mm. even those were anecdotes which were very elaborate mm. but um uh, in the first episode he spoke about how in particular kal bhairav mandirs uh, they even offer tobacco they offer cigarettes yeah, yeah. as prasad mm. yes have you experienced this yes same logic as what we spoke about with uh, the liquor little different so what has happened is over centuries the upasana of kal bhairav has reduced in india uh, something i had mentioned earlier also so because of various reasons the peak bhairav upasana used to happen in kashmir so after that bhairava got relegated to the realm of kshetrapala protector but the main upasana used to happen with devi so this offering of um, uh, whether it's uh, cigarettes or whether it's alcohol that's offered kal bhairav mandirs almost all kal bhairav mandirs will you can offer alcohol to the deity no problem at all but it is done in a very less formal manner if you look at it that way if you go to the uh, you know temple so people can just buy a bottle and just give it to the pandit ji and he will do some mantras and give it to them etc whereas in the main tantra mark and therefore you can offer uh, cigarettes and all that also especially those pratishthas of bhairav which are close to cremation grounds definitely you can offer and there are some places where even uh, in some places where bhagwan dattatreya is also offered these things but devi pratishtha properly tantrokta devi pratishtha normally we do not offer this because this so we do as the shastras tell you it is not based on what you feel like but the shastras contain something about cigarettes no it doesn't that's the whole point i'm trying to say that the it doesn't contain anything about offering cigarettes or anywhere this practices because the bhairava practices were relegated to the sidelines so these developed in a more local flavor so people thought i can give alcohol i might give cigarette also so that way and baba is kind he accepts it i am not even saying that he is not accepting it he is accepting it but this practice does not have any basis in any shastra 
whereas offering of alcohol is very clearly mentioned there are elaborate chapters on what mantras to use how to hold the patra there is a particular mudra for it everything is there is there so because bhairava practices kind of remained on the sidelines or even in the tantric field and i mean this is like after 13th 12th century when kashmir fell that was the peak bhairava so their bhairava practices were based on shastras they had kashmiri shaiva shastras and all that after that across india bhairava practice was mostly confined to whether it's kapalikas aghoris or tantrupasaks who take bhairava as the kshetrapala so they are not particularly worshiping bhairava they are worshiping the mother bhairava is a protector of that area so it's one of the anga devatas parivar devatas or even as a consort also not that intensity of focus was on bhairava so what happened is some practices developed which is perhaps not approved by the texts cigarettes is one such there is no text i have come across at least to my knowledge any of the standard tantras that mention anything about offering cigarettes okay second story that he brought up i forgot the exact name of the being that is being summoned but it's a sort of dark usage of tantra <clears throat> in the first place i think it was vashikanya or something like that if i'm vishkanya not vishkanya mm. uh for lack of a better sentence to explain it it's basically some sort of a darker angel or a darker demonic entity that you can keep with yourself throughout your life but the process to get it is very elaborate and the last stage of that process includes human feces and rubbing it on your own body and all that actually the term vishkanya is specifically uh, specifically used for certain types of feminine energies who have that capacity that they can destroy anybody the moment they get into any kind of equation physical intimacy with an individual as in it, you're referring to human beings it can be even invoked inside a human being it can be women also specifically with certain yogas whose life will be like that they have so here there are souls that are born from different realms there may be somebody who's uh, who may have been <laughs> some other realm as has come down if the deities can come down things lower can also come down so there are humans around us today on this earth which are reincarnations of a being that was previously in a lower realm very often really yes because this is the realm this this plane of ours is where you can things happen very fast that's Your, our specialty yes the, uh, the two things that are our specialty one is that things happen very fast means your average human life kitna 70 80 years max so in from the realms they come 70 80 years is like blink of an eye okay two three lifetimes you can change your destiny completely mane tum fakir se raja ban sakte ho if you have the determination for it two to three lifetimes is nothing from where they come from their realms it's like 600 700 years you do nothing chup chap baithe raho which is in our terms is like what seven eight lifetimes is gone right so they like to come here but nature is very smart the maximum amount of maya is also here the maximum amount of deluding your mind the force that can cause delusion to your mind and take you away from reality is also in this plane taking away from reality through materialism no reality means when i speak of reality i mean the spiritual reality yeah so that's it's it's like saying that people think after our death we go to the realm of dreams but in truth we are in the realm of dreams and we go to reality maybe that's one very poetic way of putting it hmm uh why well, thank you sir <laughs> no but let's let's rewind back yes. so when you're saying maya is all around us maya includes everything including the taste of the pizza you eat yeah. the sex mm-hmm. you have mm-hmm. the the money you earn yes. the fame you earn mm-hmm. on instagram mm-hmm. all that is maya mm-hmm. it's a material falsehood no so here i differ with you so there are certain philosophers that believe that maya is to be rejected it's a falsehood tantra doesn't say maya is falsehood it says it is the body of the mother she has created this jo cheez ko tum maya bol rahe ho that is also her that is a manifestation of her but in a constricted manifestation your job is to see through that see the larger manifestation of her so it is not real your pizza that you are having is not real you have to work through this realm this realm if you start with that idea that nini is sab sab bekar hai then you will go nowhere you have to first appreciate what is happening around you tantra starts that way you don't have to you know reject what is what nature has given you so your natural tendency is to eat okay 
if you leave aside all biases and if you look at the history of human development you'll see that meat eating has always been there and it'll always be there you may like it or dislike it doesn't matter never ever is it going to happen a state where people will not eat meat in fact your gut has the capacity to digest meat okay naturally it has happened you did not create it one individual did not create it natural tendency for sex certain amount i'm not saying excessive or i'm not talking about perversions i'm talking about a normal healthy tendency to the extent that we have dharma artha kama moksha kama is desire desire is actually considered as a very good thing within limits okay it makes your life happy why should you not be happy why should always you have to be grumpy about it ki sab chhod ke mujhe bhagna hai no so tantra says all these things that has been given to you that which is deluding you let us now find a way that inside it what is the germ of happiness germ of spirituality inside it i will use these very things that are supposed to make a person fall to help myself ascend upwards i am not going to reject it ki nahi nahi mujhe ye nahi karna mujhe nahi jana no but yes to do that you have to have discipline certain amount of discipline way so when coming back to the question that you had asked even when sex is to be used it is to be used in a very disciplined way it is not indiscriminate which you talking about tantra tantra okay mm. uh, outside tantra i'm not interested in tantra mm. Mm. this is used in a very disciplined and specific manner it is not something that is random so we do not reject maya maya is basically your capacity to make not see the whole picture the largest picture is that there is a constant reality the smaller picture is that we are sitting and having a discussion and this that whatever else you are going on smaller picture okay now uh, the idea is you see the smaller picture but you don't run away from it you appreciate it you connect to it and you find something meaningful out of it that is where maya the philosophy of tantra differs from the philosophy of few other vedantic philosophies where maya is kind of looked at as okay it is very negative we should not go into that so there we are saying that it's not necessarily negative there's a bit of ignorance into it that is because the the great shakti who has created this universe she constricts herself small 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 so that for our understanding and eventually enters even into the inanimate object also now your job as an upasak is that find her even in here it's not that god is up god is around you the divine is around you that is the first principle of tantra divine is around you you find it and in order to find there are certain practices and all that mantras wo whatever it is okay so that is very important now the other thing is what is an individual's maya everybody has some maya by the way constantly anything that you are very strongly attached to is going to create some impact on your mind let's say that is maya okay that anything that you are attached to so you are attached to say suppose you are attached to money and suppose you have a loss so obviously you will feel bad everybody feels bad right so that is how this kind of a attachment is the thing that is problematic in this world and the ability to switch from attachment to detachment is the capacity of a great human being perhaps romantic love is also one of yes. the greatest attachments of our 100% world. you think you love your wife or your husband most of it is destiny emotions hormones this that etc do you love your wife <laughs> everybody loves their wives okay mm. this is something i've thought a lot Mm. for myself right it wasn't meant to be a stabbing question mm. i was actually wondering for myself that mm. i do feel myself getting more detached mm. with the bhairav mantra and i'm at such a preliminary but state. for specifically for an upasak it is very good to have a uh, a partner uh, like if you're a man then having a wife or if you're a woman having a partner who understands the practice and who also practices if there is a complementary practice and it is very very helpful in that sense uh my wife's practice really helps me she also does a lot of upasana and uh, that actually allows me the freedom to do sadhanas which i can do otherwise that would not have been possible perhaps love especially from the tantric perspective is much more about spiritual companionship spiritual companionship and even non tantric perspective also at the end of the day it is companionship and adjustment yeah fair i mean any couple that stays together hmm. in the long term hmm. has become each other's spiritual companion yes you live as one being. yes provided there is a so it is not always the case by the way so i've seen the opposite sides of it also so that is why i advise people that if your partner allows you to do sadhana without obstruction 
एंड सो लॉन्ग एज यू आर डूइंग साधना दैट इज दर इज नॉट डिस्ट्रक्टिव साधना ठीक है वो भी हो सकता है वैसा नहीं नॉर्मल कोर्स में यू आर डूइंग एंड स्टैंडर्ड स्परिचुअल उपासना एंड इफ योर वाइफ और हजबेंड डज नॉट ऑब्स्ट्रक्ट यू फ्रॉम डूइंग दैट देन कंसिडर योर सेल्फ लकी the overarching conversation here was about negative beings <laughs> <laughs> sorry to bring it back there uh, that's not something uh, i know that you enjoy no, i mean yeah, i know yeah. that you don't enjoy mm. talking about it mm. but uh, i think my question is much more about reincarnation of negative beings to understand our reality better because if you simply look at everyone on earth as one family for the sake of this thought experiment hmm we're a set of souls some sitting in mumbai some sitting in banaras some sitting in dubai some sitting in london hmm. some sitting in argentina hmm. america hmm. some scientists in antarctica hmm. some way we are all connected hmm. Hmm. are we all put into this reality to get hmm. out and go to the next one and live our own random material lives and eventually find something spiritual over the course of many many lifetimes is is that the reason all of us are here because that's something i've thought a lot about but when we're talking about this vashikanya and these negative beings that also are within our reality perhaps in a human body for one lifetime no they could be for more lifetimes also really <laughs> and the tendencies manifest yes of course as what evil 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 will do evil like murderers criminals i sometimes feel that lot of the uh a lot of the serial killer types uh are possibly some kind of negative beings who have been either incarnated or which is easier for them to do which is influenced by them it's very easy for them to influence human beings very easy specifically some people who have who vibrate to those things which means that there is a craving for uh three things money sex and power any of the three deep cravings are there and they have the capacity to very easily read those cravings in a human being so accordingly they will you know give you that uh, reward and think you do this you do that etc eventually they will lead to disaster which is this whole illuminati conversation possible the conspiracy There's of a the theory, illuminati yeah. that uh, many are governed by demonic entities like right. i have a lot of catholic friends hmm. who talk a lot about this how hmm. there's probably a lot of powerful people in the mm, world mm. who are governed by demonic mm. entities we are giving the sanatani tantric version of the same story mm. Mm. no yeah i i uh, do believe that perhaps this is true to some degree uh, though i don't say that i have any direct knowledge of it but uh, it makes sense if you think about it properly and if you see the kind of evil and good that is there so the world is like uh, like a small uh, playing ground where the most supreme power which is adi mahashakti she allows everybody to come in and have your fun you fight it out see who wins when things when balance tips very badly then there is an avataran there is a great force there is a great being whom we worship as lord vishnu he comes down to set the balance again i'm so excited and yet at the same time not surprised that you got the exact question i was asking without me asking this question mm-hmm. like when you use the word playground it's mm-hmm. exactly what yes i was visualizing in my head yes my question to you is what is this playground that we call the earth so this is a playground to determine what do you want to become free so will you have, again. you have been given a free will so you want to do evil you'll so you can carry on and there'll be consequences to it so there is no free anything here so there is a playground and there is the law of karma there is karmic repercussions of it <coughs> you want to uh, there a lot of people who don't want who are not evil who don't want spirituality also they may be interested that i want a bit more money and more power and more fame which is okay they are trying for that the moment you take shortcuts and things like that the various types of shortcuts then you allow evil to enter into your mind space your life and shortcuts means it could be general shortcut like you are say you bribe somebody it's small level shortcut okay this thing only you take a very large shortcut you say that no i will actually uh, start worshiping some of these negative entities uh, negative forces and it's there across the world by the way every religion has it everywhere everywhere in the world some of these things in return for quick gains the moment quick gains come in uh they start uh, 
and and that entity has its own agenda by the way it's not going to give you anything for free nothing in the world that is worth uh, useful and generally genuine comes for free and comes quickly beware of anything that comes quickly especially spirituality if it comes very quickly then beware whether there is any shortcuts or something like that kuch to garbar kahi pe ho raha hai ha sir it it has its time what's an example of a very quick spiritual gift very quick initiation perhaps no initiation is fine by initiation by itself doesn't this days in getting an initiation is just very easiest thing okay if you have some contact some people you know some money easily you can get initiation and i have seen hundreds of people initiated into tantra uske baad kuch nahi hua okay they were they were duffers before they have remained spiritually duffers even after that because there is something more that has, anything that becomes very easy also loses its value that has happened in all fields including tantra unfortunately so there are evil entities some people take that corruption to another level where they actually start striking some kind of a uh, so it sounds transactional but it is a transaction actually but it's more like you you invoke those entities for quick gain quick fame quick money quick power whatever it is and uh, that entities can help you if you follow their method of worship uh, and in return they will also take their pound of flesh we had done that one episode you know the infamous one on yes. rakshasas asuras yes. bhut uh it was for done for a couple of reasons one that whole phase of my youtubing journey was about the occult and i genuinely had curiosity to explore it but the second reason is at that point i felt that that's how you can attract a youtube audience to mm. come and listen mm. to what the truth mm. about tantra truly is mm. i thought it's a great marketing mm. ploy mm. uh when you're talking about these entities right now mm. are they also amongst that same yeah they set, fall in that same scale that said to be spoke Boy, about that's they belong to that school only maybe the class is different somebody in class 5 somebody in class 10 aise type ka okay so it's the same uh, within that realm so these things um, uh, the last that you described those are those are very dirty kind of practices where you have to use your own feces and all that it's there uh, specifically uh, specific types of beings which are very negative which are called pishaches and all that those who worship them they use those things so even this uh, wish kanya would come in that same scale somewhere there in that god for those of you who have not seen that particular episode it's a very scary episode uh, i do not recommend that you watch it if these kind of conversations trouble you uh, and for those of you who want to go watch it watch it after this particular episode uh, it is equally exciting as well it's scarier than a horror movie we'll link it down below uh, your my ninth conversation of this week right so uh, it doesn't feel like a regular podcast because i'm just talking to you and i ask you my doubts anyway but it does require a slightly heightened level of focus right. i don't know if you feel a heightened level of focus when you're doing these ha so in general when these conversations come there has to be the energy if it has to impact an individual so what is it that impacts it's not the words that impact people think that what am i for any speaker it's the importance of the words the specific no behind the word there's an energy that goes out from the speaker and it is that energy the quality of the energy that will determine if there is going to be any impact or not or what kind of impact yeah um i want to actually talk a little bit about the project you and me are also working on yeah in a very brief way you won't even break it down too much but you've recorded meditations for level supermind right and we were just talking about how outside when mm-hmm. we are recording meditations you do put your spiritual force into it yes I would argue that uh, it is almost slightly physically draining while you're recording it. Mm. I don't know if you had the same experience. Mm. Slightly, yes. Because you're kind of leaving it for mm. a permanent purpose that mm. it should mm. heal people 30 mm. years from mm. now also. Mm. So for that 15-20 mm. minutes that you're recording the right. meditation, mm. you're really putting your life force mm. in. Mm. Uh, two questions. One, did you feel that bit of mm. power exchange? Mm. And the second is... when we talk about using spiritual force to create mm. something artistic mm. where is it originating from yourself or is it passing through you and then the passing through is the tiring phenomenon mm. so initially uh, so i i kind of i i i enjoy the concept of the project and i hope that it is really helpful to people uh, they can you know use it for wherever meditations 
and so create something so powerful and so permanent that it is not dependent on the individual so the energy has to go on and it will benefit it there will be people who are coming later they'll use it they may have great experiences they may reach a stage much higher than you and i can ever reach anything is possible right so all that way is very good yes but whenever um, i don't know about other people when i am having a conversation or uh, trying to uh, this kind of conversation spiritual conversations so there is always a bit of uh, an energy drain that happens that has to be uh, somewhere it has to take in from some source that is there uh, which is okay then again that's why i my practices replenish that energy every day when i sit yeah you know the listener perspective for rajeshi nandi is that you're a very gripping speaker now okay. if we truly reverse engineer that phrase that mm. why is this human being a gripping speaker mm. i think you use the right words at the right time and you use the right amount of silence at the right time and that actually helps people listen in more closely i'm also trying to develop that with age mm-hmm. but then with someone like you who's so connected to their deity i'd argue that the deity is governing your speech to an extent yes there is something so uh, like yesterday i was uh, talking uh, uh, if you ask me to speak on bhairava for 5 minutes say right now <clears throat> i can tell you some things one hour later you ask me i can tell you that but it will never be exact repetition of the same because i it's not scripted as i keep speaking there are things that pop in the head and it's very difficult to explain these things happen in the blink of an eye faster than the blink of an eye and i see things as images and certain things and i know that okay this is an idea that links here and this is how it must come out what is the right word if my energy level is high even the phrase will come in for tak say and i can just my job is to deliver it and then not bother about it for that the tuning has to be correct the energy level has to be high coffee is very useful <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, and if my practice or you know generally that day my energy is uh, well connected that is why so i can deliver every time i say on bhairava the information wise it will not be too different but there is the subconscious power that comes in which is going to be different every time subconscious power makes it different yes I've always wanted to ask you this as a bro and not as a podcast guest that all this information that you have in your head I I've asked you this before so and you've answered by saying that you've read the work of Sri Aurobindo and then we've had that whole tangent yeah but there's a lot that you know about mm. I know you began in engineering college and I know you weren't in an IIT so you were a good student obviously but mm. you weren't the best student or anything no. like that mm. so you're not like someone with a photographic memory mm. at least i would argue like my point of saying all this is academically speaking you're definitely smart mm. but you're not in that no, like absolutely not top rank mm. so how do you have this ability to remember so much now at age mm, 43 43 has it developed with time is it is it an outcome of you remembering everything you're reading <coughs> or is it again the deity kind of acting through you no it's it's so deity chooses the right vessel so i do it's not like i don't remember if i enjoy something i'll remember that if i've read it so i'll i have a it's not a photographic memory or anything but the gist of it remains with me and for a long time uh, remembering is not the thing what i feel that the blessing that comes uh, is that uh, suppose i'm speaking of a particular topic and i am so speaking for me is not just speaking it's like uh, uh, for lack of better words it's uh, you have to focus you have to concentrate there's it's like a meditation in a way so right moment something on the other pops up that oh, you had read that book many years ago and that paragraph and there was this story the meaning of this story is i am also understanding at the time this is how it links and that is how it comes and it happens very fast it happens organically i can't replicate it again this is what just naturally happens if i am in the right mood and if my energy is correct and if i have a receptive audience that is very important by the way it's extremely important for me so you i bounce off the energy yeah yeah i so i don't speak so so if somebody is in front of me um i know that the gen, from the body language you don't have to speak i know that is not tuned to accept spiritual realities or there is something about the individual which doesn't gel with me for lack of better words uh, with due respect then i'll completely avoid any spiritual conversation Fair. i'll speak of the weather there's that game and everything i'll consciously avoid 
these conversations are only should be in a environment where there is a certain degree of receptivity and um, that is how it works best in my opinion yeah i'm not going to take the name of this person but he's a friend of mine he's a very big youtuber okay and he is an atheist and he's a good guy like mm. he's a kind hearted guy mm. i don't think people know that about him so they make a lot of judgments about him on the internet and he's a very successful youtuber okay uh and he's doing well for himself mm. but he's as we would call it a cutter atheist mm. uh i have not i i love hanging out with him because it's very intelligent conversation that mm. that comes out that's what i'll do i won't talk mm. to him about this kind of stuff mm. Mm. i've always looked at him when he's propelling atheism mm. and i wonder to myself dude like i love you and i'm not going to counter you because you won't accept my counters mm. in the first place mm. uh but in that playground scheme of things mm. in this realm that we're in mm. there is a couple of questions for you mm. what is the purpose of an atheist mm. and secondly with a guy like this who's materially successful very very intelligent critical thinker but kind of hates the idea of god or dis- dislikes the idea of something beyond rationality mm. and scientific evidence mm. uh what is their role in this earthly playground in this life and then i would argue over the next 2 3 4 lives as well uh the only personal anecdote i have here is i have another friend who's mm. been an atheist all his life and he's gone through some tough times mm. and finally he's reached a point now where he goes like you know what bro i don't believe in god but i definitely believe in the universe mm. and it's the first time hearing him say this since age 13 mm. and we're 30 years old so in 17 years for the first time he's spoken about something metaphysical mm-hmm. and i'm like cool that's progress at least mm-hmm. so back to those first two questions what about the average atheist mm-hmm. what about <clears throat> materially successful atheists mm. so so the first point is that when i say the word playground it's a playground of possibilities every possibility that you can imagine every possibility that can happen okay good and bad ir- regardless everything all shades of all colors have been allowed to have a free run so which means that um uh, the atheist is also important in this scheme of things whatever little percentage it is there because you know what is faith only when you understand when you see atheism also so it is like a it's a the whole world is a counterbalance between things you know one side to you have people uh, i'm generally speaking a lot of uh, spiritual people have reservations about tantra using meat and all that so ye aapka kahan se aa raha hai because you have a certain perspective that this is something like that premonition ah uh, premonition bhi nahi premonition is wrong word so you have an idea that supposedly uh, there is what i call the um the uh, the satvik ego okay ha uh, huh. ki s- my i am very high and all that so mm. but that comes with perspective of something right I don't agree with that and I completely find it funny uh, but regardless my point is that all this whole world is a constant comparison there is no reality that is not without a measuring scale this is what is duality so duality in order for it to function there has to be all aspects of a thing you cannot just have one sample and then ask ki ye acha hai ki ye bura hai kaise pata chalega in comparison to something only you will understand this is good or bad you know there are gods that is why there are asuras and there are believers and then there are non believers atheists so from my philosophical point of view everybody is there everything is there in this world everything all the the darkest shades to the purest shades everything great siddha purushas are there tremendously evil entities incarnated in human beings that are also there everything is there simultaneously it's happening it's like a it's like a playground and a battleground okay how would you quantify tremendously evil uh say stalin so how many people did he kill okay i don't even know the numbers say or uh, the, you know the nazis or tremendously evil right inflicting pain within this realm pain horror at a mass scale not for one or two individuals so the the greater the evil the greater is the amount of damage it will cause mm that's wow i didn't expect you to answer that question like when that question left <laughs> i was like i wonder how so will answer this but the the amount of damage at the end of the day like i was explaining it's only your actions that matter 
वॉट यू फील इन साइड मैं बहुत संत आदमी हूँ आई एम वेरी बैड आई एम डिप्रेस आई एम हैप्पी नो बडी केयर्स द वर्ल्ड डजन केयर वॉट आर यू डूइंग वॉट इज़ योर एक्टिविटी बेस्ड ऑन एक्टिविटी विल बी जज्ड ओके सो योर एक्टिविटी हैज बिन सो यूल समबडी से योर मीन सेवन से स्टालिन समबडी लाइक स्टालिन सो यूल देर आई डोट नो मिलियंस एंड मिलियंस एंड हाउ मेनी यू किल्ड एंड ऑल दैट यू कैन बी वेरी सेफली यू कैन कैटेगराइज हिम एज एन इंडिविजुअल इज एक्सट्रीमली इवल राइट You'd argue it was a reincarnation from a lower realm. No, I I would like to. I think uh, Sri Aurobindo had written in some of his writings. Uh, he was uh, he was an asura. Stalin. Ha. Huh. He I was an asura. Sri so, Aurobindo has categorically written this. Yes, uh, I don't exactly remember which text was it right now because I read it long back. But he was quite clear about this, and in fact about Hitler also. By the way, he had mentioned that there is a. there's a very interesting episode uh, where he mentioned that there is a being used to appear in front of hitler uh, dressed up as he used to call itself as the um, the lord of nations or something like that dressed in some kind of a silver attire or something would appear in front of hitler and would direct him where to attack and what and all that etc various things were there by the way there was a exorcism tried on hitler by i think the church uh, during that time really okay. so all these things are there atheists can disbelieve that's okay but i uh, so from the believer's point of view it is the activity of the individual which will determine and the greater is the evil greater is the stamp it will leave so remember this thing that the depth and the strength of the evil is understood equally depth and the strength of the good is understood by the impact you leave it is the activity that finally determines so one individual if there is suppose a suppose there is a spirit okay trapped somewhere in a house or something causing trouble to one individual maybe possessing it's it's bad situation but it is not an evil of that caliber that caliber evil is not interested in one or two individuals it is interested in doing such an activity that will cause lot of damage creating a dent in humanity sort of that's what their primary aim is but karma always works even for them even they it works karma. for everybody and they're not aware like these entities Uh, which create evil at a mass scale. No, their uh, so th- th- uh, their purpose is to create evil. They they do not function by the laws of human morality. Human morality is only for humans. It's neither for the gods nor for them. By the way, even gods don't function based on human morality. It's all it's our system that we have created to keep things under balance. Otherwise, these three things, lust, power, and money, will corrupt. corrupt e humans do not have the capacity to handle these powers infinitely it will completely corrupt self inflicted injury will come in order to regularize things make it more sane make it more livable that is why the idea of morality and ethics came into play i'm wondering that this sri aurobindo reference that you gave about stalin and hitler did he talk more about his i i i exactly don't remember was it stalin or lenin either of these uh, no. one individual he mentioned that he was a lenin was not uh, entirely evil i don't think he has a very evil either way so my point is that there are there are uh, people who have caused tremendous amount of damage huge amount of mass scale deaths and all that okay and brutal deaths cruel deaths so that is also the other aspect of these being said they love cruelty so the dharmic way of killing something is that you do it with the least amount of cruelty you kill because the, eventually at the end of the day there will be wars lord krishna fought wars lord rama fought wars but war that is justified war when everything else has failed and which does not necessarily involve cruelty unnecessary cruelty war is a great point to kind of begin a tangent from this playground uh base level mm. i've always thought to myself about why wars happen in the first place mm. because it's an explosion of suffering mm. why are the gods why are the deities looking down at this and almost allowing it to happen no again it's human free will yes so mm. th- so they are not allowing or disallowing they are not they don't think like that allowing disallowing war will always be there whenever there is friction in your heart that is the beginning of war as simple as that now you get collectively together and then you fight or you just sit together sit in a chair and be grumpy ki my boss is doing like that and that guy the war has already started so it is a human tendency 
um you know i mean very small anecdote but uh, i believe it said about i don't remember which mughal ruler but there was one particular mughal ruler that tried invading the northeast mm. and he couldn't conquer the ahom dynasty in assam yes uh and there's a story <clears throat> about how yes. during that battle mm. uh, there was some kind of tantra used mm. by the ahom mm. uh kings yes uh, i'd seen a youtube video about this i think mm. have you heard of this yes this is a very famous incident in fact in the history of uh, the uh, assam that is written formally in texts and all that so they mentioned that and it was originally mentioned by the muslim chroniclers themselves okay so i um, uh, in one of the attacks that was uh, done on the kamrup kingdom there uh, it's said the muslim chroniclers believe that what happened is overnight uh, the attack happened and the next day they found that the horses were there and the men were not there it's like a lack people vanished or something like that it created such a fierce psychosis for uh, for a long time aurangzeb could not even gather an army to attack because they used to say that how will you fight something that you cannot see okay to attack the um so um yes definitely there was there was so the whole point one of the things in tantra shastra there are these um uh, prayogas that are mentioned all texts of tantras will mention application of the power hmm. if you have power how do you know that you are powerful if you don't apply it just claiming that i am powerful is useless you have to show to the world as i said it's, it's the world who will judge your statements are meaningless so in tantra knows this tantra understands this principle so every text of tantra and i'm not talking the do rupya wala market mein milne wala actual authentic scriptures of tantra of any deity will always mention the prayogas at the end ki what prayogas can be done the reason is discrimination is yours ethics is yours but suppose you need to apply it suppose your community is in threat your country is in threat your life is in threat then you are at free will nature allows you that liberty to use those vidyas to protect yourself so far as possible what do you think was used in that particular battle i don't know but uh, i can assume that during those eras places like kamakya specifically kamakya was far more intense now to people are gathering and all that so a lot of people come even texts which are uh, say 100 years old uh, on kamakya uh, descriptions of pilgrims and all that so there is to be this fear and they would say that you know if you go up the hill make sure you come down before nightfall don't stay there too long because there are various mysterious powers there these places now are becoming more common there a lot of people go there it's mm-hmm. not easy to explain to them what this is but remember that for centuries there is to be a certain degree of reverence also fear with respect to the kamakya pitha and the nilachal parvat the mountain that is there on uh, on which ma kamakya's temple is situated and there are so many stories related to this there are uh, she's she's beautiful she's playful at the same time she can be very angry also uh, she's a different type of a deity so all these things are there so so un- so point is uh, when do you use what is up to your discrimination tantra is the method of accelerating an activity to the point where you attain perfection accelerating an activity to the point where you attain perfection yes and that could be anything you want to slap somebody slap him so well that <laughs> that he doesn't come back to you again i don't remember who it was but there was some spiritual person on the show uh where i had i had questioned about my future and that person said that don't worry the upasana you're doing is creating so much power that anything you put it towards will be all right mm. same logic as what you're saying that you're generating spiritual power through some practice and then you can channelize it into any action yes so so my what yeah correct and my point is this is a specificity of tantra by the way so other paths do not delve into prayogas so their idea is that you are only spiritual you do the spiritual activities and you transcend to the higher realms tantra see the, to to make it very simple the other spiritual paths consider certain qualities as very divine say love is divine peace is divine tranquility is divine uh, detachment is divine all these things are divine right it's very nice tantra says all these are divine additionally power is also divine ooh power the source of all power is mahashakti she is the one who governs the power she is the divine governs all power she is personified as devi so now when power comes into the equation so your idea is that through sadhana you acquire 
if you are a right minded upasaka if you are an upasaka so you are not those one of those you know uh, you know baba types sitting and doing uh, jharphuk wala if you are an upasaka your aim is to reach the highest power and there is if you if you have an allergy to the word power then tantra sadhana is not for you in the first place at all you must be brave enough for that you must understand that no you have to take that power without power your movement upwards will not happen as simple as that movement upwards is again another great point i want to bring forth we spoke about this world around us as a playground hmm. so now there are children playing in the playground hmm. which is all of us atheists murderers everybody warlords hmm. saints hmm. good people hmm. uh podcasters <laughs> everyone's in this right fishbowl Mix. business hmm. people hmm. whatever uh some people just want to stay in the material plane and i guess that's okay mm. if you don't put judgment mm. upon those people mm. uh some people suddenly spiritually mm. awaken that's all the people who are listening into mm. this conversation mm. who at least question the nature mm. of reality mm. usually since their childhoods mm. now when you grow to a certain age perhaps information reaches you in some form mm. which is again happening to the viewers through you mm. which is why people wait for your episodes for so long because i think you're giving them nuggets of information mm. now let's visualize this as rajesh nandi being one of the children in that playground mm. okay you're one of the more experienced children so you figured out something about this playground and you're giving out these notes to people saying you know what if you look up there that's bhairav mm. if you latch onto that that's kamakya devi mm-hmm. is that a fair way of looking at tantra that these are the deities are for lack of better words higher beings which are able to actually lift you out of the playground and into a much better bigger happier more peaceful more powerful playground yeah that's one way of looking at it so basically for the sake of this conversation this playground that i am talking about is only the human playground okay human beings are there but so they live in a different realm if you worship them what you attain is a closeness to them and eventually uh, you will start reflecting their qualities and eventually you will transcend the um, uh, so these when i when i say that lust power and money are the three things that corrupt the problem with this is unrestricted amount of this is that eventually eventually and it is seen through thousands of years of experience across religions philosophers etc they will lead to suffering okay so at some point why do you enjoy the high then the low will come the suffering will happen so the whole problem of this of religion and philosophy came with the understanding how do i transcend suffering completely hmm that i may never ever ever suffer physically <laughs> mentally emotionally spiritually anyway because being in that playground will make you, make you go suffer. through suffering so this is mrityu loka the if at all even if you are never suffered the moment of death you will suffer there is going to be some amount of pain in death okay so this is the way it is it is how it is right so the reason we do upasana of the devatas is primarily because by doing so eventually for the right person you can transcend these qualities which make you suffer and you become a reflection of the deity deities don't suffer these things they are beyond their at a level that they do not suffer these things at all and they have been there for thousands and god knows when and they will always be there do they suffer from anything i don't know i don't think they suffer from anything i think uh, they are from our perspective eternal I won't take the name of the deity unless you wish to, but you said that X deity was relegated to become a Shetrapal. Ha ha ha. No, it's okay. Bhairava was relegated to become a Shetrapal. Yes. W- relegated in sports terms means you finish at the bottom of the league, therefore you go to the lower league. Okay, so this is basically that uh, when the peak Bhairava Upasana used to happen in Kashmir and other places. after that fall happened so bhairava's role in the other sampradayas was that of a kshetrapala uh, as well as in the tantra sampradaya his role is that of the peripheral guardian of the path uh, to some degree he will also help in the being a guru of the path and also at times as a consort of the path but primarily the upasana is happening of devi the focus was not on bhairava so bhairava is on the sidelines 
in the tantric path more or less to peak bhairava upasana used to happen around i think 13th 14th century maybe 13th century after that it kept falling and it, it kind of relegated it relegated means it what i mean is specifically it kind of um, sort of shifted towards more uh, large part of folklore large part of colloquialism in there not necessarily based on complete shastras um, some places yes but not so much he was never almost rarely ever the primary devata hmm unlike shiva unlike, unlike devi shiva. yes that's what i mean okay there's a statement that you keep repeating on the show and offline which is that bhairav is waking up again yes uh there's a couple of questions mm. one why was he asleep because mm. i mean it could be argued that in, during the invasions many bhairav temples were destroyed mm. therefore there weren't that many people practicing bhairav worship in the first place mm. but a more metaphysical way of looking at it is the deity is much more powerful than even war and warlords so was it the deity's will to go to sleep for some time so that is a question where we cannot have a definite answer we can speculate at best okay, okay. because nobody really knows fully the mind of the deity but deities can and very often do they may withdraw themselves from playing in the world for some period of time the moment a deity withdraws himself or herself what you will see is that experiences related to the deity will suddenly reduce great souls or upasakas of the deity will stop getting born that's one of the things that will happen in fact the average person connection to the deity is very minor average human being doesn't understand it is too much to be honest a overall idea you have that i am born into hindu family so i know this is hanuman ji this is ma durga and all that is there but you really start connecting when there is at least one individual who has attained to some degree of contact with the deity you follow that individual through that individual you connect to the energy of the deity this is a very standard practice across india okay in tarapit for example right now it's a very popular place in bengal a lot of people go there tarapit really became very famous after the birth and the life of Bama Khepa Bama Khepa was a siddha purusha who used to remain in the cremation ground who was known as who was like a child of matara okay so matara was always there those who have to do the upasana they used to go at one point but the kind of fame that it has acquired right now is entirely because there was a siddha who had attained perfection in the upasana of matara so this is what happens in the world also so when a deity withdraws himself or herself he makes sure that great siddhas uh individualistic one to who may be there but somebody who can awaken masses is not going to get born who is connected to that deity because he or she stops uh, sending his energy to put it in a very normal way of conversation hmm. so obviously even now there are certain deities that are dormant yes many perhaps many perhaps there are deities who have never been active in the world of human beings ah oh, okay they don't like contact being were interacting with humans i actually bought a book on witchcraft just out of interest mm. and it was about worldwide witchcraft okay. uh the moment i opened that book first i got sometimes you can just feel the consciousness of certain mm. books also mm. how how do you feel when you're going through the words right etc mm. i just felt very dark reading that mm. book so i didn't go through it completely but i read the chapter on deities it didn't actually have anything written about hindu deities mm. but it had a lot written about mesopotamian deities egyptian deities okay. etc like ra anubis right. uh, in mesopotamia there's gilgamesh mm. few more mm. there are all these names that mm. you've heard mm. there's greek deities like mm. zeus mm. hades all these right those are perhaps the deities that have chosen to exit the human world possible the other thing is that some of those deities are actually worshiped among us also go on for example anubis so he has the face of a dog okay and he is the one who takes a soul after death through their uh, i don't remember the terminologies but they have a kind of a river they river. have to cross and all that so he is the deity who has a connection to wolf jackal who is a connection to death who is worshiped by the pharaohs who looks who's a male deity who takes you across that river of death this is exactly what bhairava does of all places why do you think they found out a deity who has the face of a jackal or a dog could have been cow it could have been anything because the deity impresses his energy on to the upasakas these are the seers these are the rishis we call okay of a culture so deity this iconography of the devata also comes from the deity he it's not just some artist's random imagination he inspires the mind 
and says that okay this is how you look at me this is the ayudhas the weapons this is the vahana this is the etc and then there are mantras and all this gets revealed over time and then the lesser upasakas like us we follow those leads that have been given to us same way a devata can appear in multiple cultures at multiple times he is not tied to a or b culture at all most deities la very vast um, deities of great of the greatest realms they are not connected to a or b specific culture they may make their appearance in other cultures but with some modification uh, due to the local uh, circumstances and other things or the, based on the understanding of that culture to modify itself so the playground has a limited number of bosses in what sense in terms of deities yes uh, This, yes and and a part of the playground will view that same deity in different manner yeah as in another from another part yes. of, of the playground yes so the kids sitting in south america probably are also worshiping Possible. a deity that's being worshiped in india yes in the same way the anubis from egyptian culture is perhaps bhairav okay very likely very likely bhairav uh what's the difference between bhairav kal bhairav mahakal and shiva so shiva when you say let us assume sada shiva sada shiva is the very peaceful and calm form for practical purposes understanding okay for 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 not going too much into a theory of it for practical understanding of it and this was told to be told to me and which i found very useful in my own sadhana so moment you consider shiva as outside of the cremation ground who is married to parvati and there is children ganesha and kartikeya soma skandha we call him the murti etc so that is shiva as the auspicious most auspicious the moment shiva turns into enters the cremation ground he becomes bhairava he turns his roopa into that of bhairava in certain states of great power where it is needed he turns himself into bhairava so bhairava is not fundamentally different from shiva in fact the shiva puran actually mentions this particular sloka there is there which is there is no difference between shiva and bhairava it is only the maya of shiva that makes you see these two as different practically speaking bhairava is a more aggressive intense form of shiva that has some connection to the cremation grounds okay cremation ground means death so if bhairava blesses somebody he can also uh, uh, ensure what is your manner of death when will you die things like that he has control over all these things okay uh, so that is one kala bhairava is the primary form of bhairava okay kala bhairava is the form of bhairava who emanated from shiva and the first thing that he did was when did he, when did bhairava come out because when there the story says that brahma started saying that he is as good as shiva okay and then out of the anger of shiva kala bhairava manifested and with the nail of his little finger in the left hand he cuts off brahma's fifth head okay for that arrogance because shiva is beyond brahma then brahma realizes that this is uh, this is shiva's only shiva is the supreme that head of brahma gets stuck in kala bhairava's hand that is the first brahma hatya brahma hatya means um killing killing of, of a brahmin okay so brahmin is in that specifically era somebody who leads his life by upasana of the deities by the rules that is governing the deities etc so that is an that is a thing of respect right so it acquires power certain degree of power that comes in it was the traditional idea i'm talking about and i'm not going into the intricacies and years of caste system but brahma hatta is a sin is a pap bhairava is the one who creates the first brahma hatta because he destroys the head of brahma who is the one who takes the vedas and who gives and who gives the rules of the vedas etc etc so then it is said that in order that people do not get misguided because after all brahmatta is a very negative thing so he takes up a penance just to show people it's a leela we call it a play he doesn't need to do it because he is already very high up but he takes up this penance shiva tells him that you go ahead go ahead begging with that bowl in your hand okay what is that bowl that is the skull of brahma in his hand so he goes around for 12 years across india and across the world universe he goes to vaikuntha vishnu is there vishnu looks at him and says that you are so this is you are playing around you are shiva only okay why are you doing this leela 
things like that and then vishnu tells him go to kashi so he enters kashi moment he enters kashi that that skull of brahma that was there falls down at a place called kapal mochan okay and that is why and then he resides in kashi permanently as a guardian of kashi okay kashi is also a very spiritual state so kala bhairava basically is a deity who sustains creates and who eats away your sins he can destroy your sins wash your karmas wash your karmas when he washes the karmas sometimes there is a thing in it's believed that suppose somebody dies in kashi you attain to the liberation completely okay moksha liberation will come but liberation comes due to before that there is something known as bhairav yatana yatana means pain bhairava what he does is that in a very brief period of time the karmic things that you had to experience across many lifetimes he will ensure that it is uh, you you undergo that in a very brief span of time and you finish off your karmas and then you are free and then you can be enlightened he gives that there's a metaphysical meaning to this kashi is also a particular state where it is of intense luminous light and very powerful and beautiful very deep condition bhairava is the one who guards that place he ensures who can enter and who is fit to enter and who is not fit to enter okay. he is the he is a kshetrapala no doubt he guards kashi but also he becomes eventually as kala bhairava there is another aspect the name kala is specifically given he can scare yama he can scare death so death which is the most transformative and perhaps the most dangerous thing we have or something that causes fear in everybody that itself is scared of bhairava which means that bhairava upasana eventually if a person continues will slowly make you fearless that quality will rub off rub off into an individual and when i say fearless i don't mean fearless of ghosts and all that most of the time we are fearful of circumstances of people of life in general what is going to happen tomorrow what is going to happen he takes you to a state bhairava takes you eventually to a state that you are able to digest reality as it is and you're not scared you're not running away you are where you are he does it not by changing your circumstances that is possible he can do that if he is happy he can i have i get so many mails from people they started bhairav upasana and some magical good thing happened etc very nice but the primary thing is that he gives you the power to go through that fear and then you attain to a condition where you don't care that is very typically one of his blessings detachment basically yes a sense of detachment but also activity bhairava is a very active deity shiva if you if you now coming back to shiva so uh, the the way we worship shiva is shiva is there and parvati is there so his shakti is outside okay so shiva in a way is the personification of the static state of realization so you come into shiva tatva and you become very peaceful and calm and you are not bothered about duniya kya kar raha hai mere ko kya karna hai that type of a thing shiva shiva great spiritually for example ramana maharishi okay just like that he sits in the mountain he is in a very exalted condition shakti is outside shakti is what creates the world runs the world shiva is detached from that but in the bhairava state shakti is inside him so uh, bhairava is will make you very active also he will make you work what is mahakal mahakal is time personified in a way and mahakal is the highest form of bhairava it is a bhairava yes mahakal bhairava and mahakal is worshiped not only among us but also among bodhas and it is <coughs> uh, perhaps uh, around 11th 12th century uh, i was interestingly reading about mahakal practices among uh, buddhists i don't know much about them Uh, but somebody gifted me a very beautiful mahakal uh, painting mm. um, and um, so 11th century there was a monk i don't remember his name who had come to nalanda uh, and he was meditating on the cremation grounds near that and he sees uh, gets an instruction or inspiration from mahakal and he takes that mahakal practices to tibet and through him eventually bent all the schools of tibetan buddhism have some or the other mahakal related practice Uh, as a as a as a primary guardian deity of the sampradaya as a as a protector of their dharma and things like that okay chakra samvara ha that called. is another deity i i think mahakal is another okay i believe chakra samvara is their version of shiva 
because it okay. resides on mount kailash with his wife who's represented by red and he's represented by blue okay i mean what the, at least the, it's too strong a parallel to not also <laughs> there is uh, so these are all controversial zones actually because uh, uh, it's possible that some of their practices may have been inspired by the original shaiva tantra that was there around kashmir etc uh, so yeah there may be similarities even in the paddhatis but they do very strong tantra sadhana there is no doubt about it at leaving aside the deities leaving aside the mantras etc uh, this uh, many of the paddhatis and all that which whatever i've read from the internet of course i have no direct experience of them uh, is definitely very hardcore tantra sadhana paddhati is paddhati is method. method method of sadhana okay, okay. so mahakal goes there in india also mahakal is there ujjain mahakal is there but uh, the mahakal practices here were more confined to the aghori sampradayas very less was done in the in its proper hardcore manner among the um, average ubasakas <coughs> there are two ways in which people can approach mahakal um, one is through the tantra marga where mahakal bhairava is the consort of dakshinakali okay the only in this krama the only being that is more intense than mahakal is kali okay but to reach her you will need his blessings because he is the one who is the mantra drashta he is the one who sees the mantras of kali and gives it to the world okay there is somebody called kali who is so and so who which is the mantra for it how to do prostration of it etc all that and there is the other krama krama means path of movement other path of movement where where people where one can go from bhairava is kala bhairava and then mahakal bhairava okay so that there are no other feminine deities involved so that is also possible but mahakal practices have more or less reduced in intensity in india so what is there is uh, minor and it is confined only to some uh, you know uh, augur sampradayas etc so it is not as abiding as as powerful and widespread sort of and as intense obviously because what happens is if he is not the mula devata if if somebody is not the primary deity then you will your puja paddhati etc will be subservient to the primary deity whoever you consider you know when you're growing up in mumbai hmm. you will be connected to sanatan dharma if you are born in a hindu family in some way or the other but it's not the version of sanatan dharma you often see in say banaras or right. punjab or wherever like here it's a lot about ganpati worship like mm. so you see a lot of ganesh mm. ji uh like the first time i heard the word mahakal was actually the virat kohli video where he goes jay mahakal jay mahakal acha <coughs> now mm. one way of looking at the mm. situation is on a surface level that oh virat kohli went to ujjain's mahakal and said jay mahakal mm. a deeper way of looking at it is this is the country's biggest icon and it's one of the world's biggest icons he's saying something related to religion he had a very important life event in this particular temple and eventually one day ho- hopefully a 100 years into the future virat kohli is going to pass away and 100 years after that not too many people will even remember him who's possibly the most famous indian right now hmm. that is what mahakal is but mahakal chose this one icon to be able to say his name in terms of jay mahakal it taught me as a guy in mumbai who's never heard of mahakal it taught me about mahakal and now here we are on this podcast which is going to get watched by a million people and amplifying mahakal because i am a virat kohli fan <laughs> and i am a kal bhairav uh yeah worshipper uh i've still not understood what mahakal is i mean it's the closest i've come to understanding it but the deeper way of looking at it is that these deities are waking up now another thing about mahakal is there are mahakal mantras okay and japa and all that everything can be done mantra is a way to connect to a deity okay mahakal mantras are there <clears throat> i find meditation on mahakal to be more fruitful than mantra sadhana if you can meditate which is unfortunately 90% people cannot okay meditation is not just sitting your full concentration is there mahakal is that being which is at the last frontier of your imagination wow jiske baad aur kuch your mind is going to now burst open in the seams it can't go beyond this <laughs> last thing edge of the universe edge it's like suppose you are losing consciousness last second mein jo yaad rehta hai that is mahakal 
and he can take any shape any form anywhere from a chair to a enlightened being he can become anything the very edge of your universe is mahakal edge of your universe do you know that the mahakal mandir is being visited by other creators as well kuldeep yadav is going there my friend okay. kl rahul is going there okay and i asked kl how it was he was just like very very powerful mm-hmm. too powerful mm-hmm. my question is these are really high profile people what in that temple is calling these people there or bringing these people there and why that particular temple but come to think of it if you if you go into history uh these temples have always attracted powerful people kings have gone there ministers have gone there who else has not gone there in that era that time whoever was the most powerful people they would have gone there whoever was ruling say in those areas and of uh, hindu uh, faith would have surely gone there the overarching question here is why does it attract powerful people no it attracts everybody i feel uh, perhaps sometimes what happens is they go there and they see some uh, positive event happens in life so you get more emotionally connected to that space why does the positive event happen after you go to that temple? that could be just random okay mm, that could be random that could be maybe some past life link is there or could be hundreds of other reasons uh, like, so yeah I've, i've heard a lot of people say that it fast forwards your karmas again which is what you said i think about bhairav no that is if you're doing the sadhana See, there are two things you have to understand. This very clearly. You can go to any temple in the world. Okay, you can go to Mahakal. You can go to Mahakamakya. You can go anywhere. Have darshan. Do normal puja. Come back. That is one thing. Everybody is allowed to do all that. The moment you do sadhana, that is when your karmas are going to burn. That is when the deity's attitude towards you will change completely. Okay. I'm genuinely not trying to make this an egoistic conversation and talk about just me here. but it's one of the easiest ways to explain yeah. thoughts better mm. you know that i'm grateful towards you for introducing me to whatever little sadhana that yeah. you've introduced me to and the sadhana that i'm practicing is mm. exactly what is available on your youtube yes. channel in yes. that one video yes. you've just mentioned a few things yes. you've in fact told me to do a step which i've not yet done because mm. somewhere internally i don't feel ready for mm. that step mm. Mm. can i say it no no it's okay we'll say it later okay. not here okay the um <laughs> basically what i'm doing mm. right now is i have a mala given to me by our mm. common friend mm. dear friend bhavesh bhai mm. bhavesh yug yes he got me a mala from rishikesh okay. like uh, and i'm just doing an om bhairavaya nama chanting on it right i my anushthan with mm. the deity is one mala a day mm. but i ensure it goes up to five because mm. i don't know my natural aggression has made its way to the mm. sadhana probably mm. and on days i take it to 10 mm. there are occasional days where i take it to like 20 mm. sometimes but five you, you is usually what happens mm. so this practice that i'm doing mm. could it be argued that when a human is doing this kind of a practice is it more powerful than just visiting a temple or equal or comparable so the, it's about what is your aim what is your aim so an upasaka's aim sadhak's aim is to transform himself person who is going to the temple normally is not going to transform himself he is going there to have darshan pray mujhe ye chahiye wo chahiye thoda darshan karke aa gaya pani chara ke aa gaya sab theek hai apne jagah pe sadhana is it changes the perspective you are trying to change yourself and immediately the deity will also change the perspective towards you i used to tell one some people who my guide i used to tell them specifically <clears throat> uh, to bring a reference to matara for example so we have tarapit and we have many other places so it is wonderful to visit tarapit anybody can visit any time kabhi bhi chale jao it's wonderful you have a terrific darshan brilliant terrific now start the mantra sadhana ugra tara then you will understand that matlab uh, kitna dam hai pata chal jayega what happens nothing it is like <clears throat> it is like putting your hand inside a tornado to to give a very we fight here yeah. things happen in your life it will happen how st- her bhairav is akshob byakshob means steady <laughs> she is already telling you that you have to be steady so she is not asking that you do the sadhana if you want to do the sadhana if you are inclined to do the sadhana then you have to become that steadiness has to be there and that's i'm giving one example same would perhaps apply for mahakal also you sit and do mahakal mantra japa 
and you go and you have a proper guru uh, upadesh and all that and you have the right mala and all that and you go and sit for say 10 days i'll sit in the mahakal temple premises anywhere and i will start doing mahakal mantra japa okay when uh, the mantra starts activating it connects to your chit shakti the deity will start manifesting somewhere then you will be tested it's not that simple that it'll just come with you because i have bhakti no are you do you have the capacity for it that is the thing but the good thing about nature is that if you have patience eventually one day you will succeed it may be take it may take lifetimes but success will come eventually we spoke about how the earthly playground is the fastest place for growth <coughs> potentially one of the fastest yes which is why lower beings are also born here yes a higher beings also born here yes so we spoke about how lower beings could manifest as extremely evil historical figures who create mass destruction um do they also pray to the deities they pray they have everybody prays to someone upstairs they have according something. to their according to their tendencies or something they pray to their own deity so what is a prayer exactly the thing you said about transformation no so prayer is you can pray to anything or anybody i can pray to my boss in the office i need a leave that's a prayer so you are looking up to something and you are asking for something that is a prayer fundamentally okay so that they do that everybody prays to something whomever you are looking up to is kind of the you are at that time that is the your boss or somebody who can grant your prayer whether it works or not is different matter but that's the way so yes in that sense they do it brings me back to the previous point about it's actually a batman dialogue ki it's not what you are underneath it's your actions that define you mm-hmm. so if a lower being if a very evil person also does the sadhana there will be some benefits that they will gain from it no so so coming back to another point that i had mentioned the idea of morality good and bad we have it <laughs> it doesn't work there it doesn't work downstairs niche ka bhi nahi hai upar mein bhi nahi hai utna so they can pray that i want more evil powers there are lot of gods who have nothing to do with the human realm at all for them it doesn't matter you are just one more species in the in the uh, you know the uh, zoo of species some random ant ha huh, and then there are so many cycles of creation that have happened uh, absolutely insignificant we we are just a small ant a small ant with a huge ego ki sab hamare liye ban gaya hai aise types ka so mm-hmm. for them if those entities are praying ki give me more of those powers and we have evidence of this in the shastras only the asuras used to how did the asuras become powerful they would do terrific sadhana the kind of sadhana they do humans can't do that type of sadhana and through that they attain powers fantastic blessings and powers so much power they attain that they can challenge the gods they defeat the gods they take over the swarga or the the divine planes until finally the the main deities who are beyond the normal gods realm of the normal gods brahma not brahma vishnu or shiva or uh, devi or something or skanda kartike they finally any of them gets involved in and then destroy the asuras but the other the slightly lesser deities they can easily overcome but how do they do th- they do that because they are um, they practice this sadhanas so there are no uh, in these beings even in the negative beings there are no atheists by the way <laughs> there are no atheists atheists are actually a very safe category atheists are only apni duniya mein mast hai so long as they are not obstructing what i have i know people who are atheists the common equation is that a i will not discuss this with you but Uh, a b you should not have any kind of obstruction to what i am doing in the sense so long as you follow a certain basic uh, respect for the individual and that is individual respects whatever you do whether you believe or not is relevant and so long as my practice is not causing any direct or indirect physical or other harm to anybody it's none of your business it's yeah. very safe fair uh so you answered one question in terms of those lower beings also definitely pray to, to the deities mm. uh the second question i have for you is on that playground uh not all higher beings are deities there are higher beings that are lower than deities yes they could be born in our realm absolutely so how we spoke about the lower beings being born in our realm and then causing havoc 
and pain yes. and suffering hmm. when the higher beings are born in our realm what do they cause their innate capacity will manifest in something or the other in this realm so there could be somebody who comes from the realm of uh, there are divine musicians called gandharvas if they get born they'll still make fantastic music here terrific means beyond terrific it's it's what we call genius level uh, compositions or something like that something so genius is of genius is something that cannot be imitated gifted talented means you you practice and you you are you have this much talent you practice you go up to this much talent gifted theek hai genius is like a jump at a different scale unachievable i unachievable either you are there or you are not there it's as simple as that lionel hmm. messi ha in football perhaps hmm. in music if you are talking say say beethoven or something i'm just giving a random example or mozart or this type of people it's very likely that they are some of these beings who come down to the earth plane and get born here and often may not know that they are high ha they will not know so that is the maya is very strong the maya of the goddess is very strong she will ensure that once you're born here it's a filter on your head you don't remember what you are from where you are coming from but why is that soul born here in the first place again for advancement there may be some desire the whole world runs on desire the mother of all desires is kameshwari whole world runs on desire every moment there's a desire there's a desire in the cells of your body when you are suppose sitting down and uh, suppose you are you are getting a tattoo done and you are feeling pain so where is before your brain registers all your cells are screaming out in desire that no i don't want this desire is ingrained into life there is nothing without desire you are not even a stone you are just out of the equation that is why kameshwari is the ultimate of all forms she produces desires even in other beings higher beings she controls desires perhaps that's why bhairav's biggest blessing is detachment yes some amount of detachment from the lower kind of desires so that you are you are you have the bandwidth to inculcate and contemplate on the higher type of desires which is what i want to go spiritually higher i want to experience the other realms if your mind is always in the lower three chakras it will not go up so that is how these things work um there are obviously also higher beings that are born here and know that they are higher beings depends in my view uh 90% don't know 95% do we have it in india i am sure there must be i'm sure there must be across the world not just india i'm sure there must be there uh, i'm sure that so basically what happens is their tendencies are that aligned to that particular domain of expertise they have so they're so naturally tuned to that that wherever they may be born they'll still end up doing that activity only and they'll do it to a tremendous degree of perfection that the world will say wah matlab kya kar gaya hai so terrific and perhaps history will also remember them as a god they will remember them as a great individual in that field don't yeah. no so it's not the word god so so suppose a musician great musician terrific compositions and all that and whatever it is and then he dies for centuries and centuries people are saying what a great musician in his personal life and other things may be completely nonsense there is don't so this is the thing just because somebody in fact more often than not somebody of the higher beings when they come here they have adjustment issues first thing <laughs> ha ha so they are not accustomed to being with human beings na so one of the typical things is you'll see that they have very bad behavior towards others Damn. more or less and they have uh, they will be known uh, by people around uh, so this is not always but this is largely either rude or arrogant or uh, somebody who has perhaps uh, suffering from some kind of uh, range of mental disorder or some behavioral issues or this that etc can't relate to people or um, uh, maybe completely a loner or may end up having innumerable relationships or something like that so a person who is a complete loner cut off and who has innumerable relationships both are dif- somewhere internally there is a loneliness hmm. in both cases they will both looking for something and not finding it okay so so these beings if they are born suddenly it's like that um, uh, somebody who lives in a country and suddenly is transplanted into another country there is an adjustment issue that can happen i mean let's go back to the era when there was no television so you don't know what is america kuch pata nahi hai suppose you go from here to there uh, it's natural that you will have some days of the way they dress where they speak where they eat or things like that you don't know anything zero knowledge 
suddenly you may not like it also and very often they they do not even lead very happy lives but the talent is so so crazy level so uh, absolute level of talent it's ingrained in them they may or may not be happy but they'll still produce absolute masterpieces comment down below who are your picks <laughs> of higher beings reborn in our earthly realm um i've just got an intuition to stop this episode now all right thank you sir yeah fun first conversation after ages i was looking right. forward to this one but now that we've hit this flow we're going to go deeper okay uh i want to give a shout out to you again for also being part of level supermind thank you sir thank you. like that whole app has been made with our heart right and every time i'm recording any of those meditations i truly put my heart and soul in. Mm-hmm. so i'm just glad that you're also present right. on the app and right. i hope you had a good experience yes and i hope that a lot of people actually do the bhairava meditations and it benefits them yeah. spiritually yeah uh i want to talk in the next episode about this overall rise of consciousness of bhairava yes that's a topic that we've not unlocked correct uh so we'll head into that fantastic there is a rise of the deities happening yes. and i've posed this question to lots of people and mm. everyone's answered it from a bhakti mm. point of view some have dismissed it mm. uh you're the only person who can truly answer this mm. rise of the deities angle mm. so i will see you in 2 minutes yes we'll see you guys next month sorry <laughs> see you <laughs> ladies and gentlemen that was the episode one out of four epic episodes has now been uploaded that's what you just saw what i will tell you is that it kept becoming more and more intense as we kept recording the second third and fourth episodes got even heavier even more complex so i can't wait to release them honestly but we'll be releasing them slowly what i will tell you again is that if you want more of rajashi nandi make sure you head over to level supermind there is only a certain amount of guidance and mentoring that you can receive from these knowledge bombs that we create on the ranvi show but if you truly want to imbibe the real knowledge of tantra you have to begin some kind of practices yourself at least begin with some basic meditations related to the world of tantra you're going to be able to find them on this collaboration over on level supermind make sure you download it the links are given down below all i'll say is that an epic lineup of podcasts is coming at you on this youtube channel through the ranveer show ranveer will be back soon the team will be back soon and you know it rajeshi nandi is going to come back for another three epic episodes of this epic tantra series